I'm joined by Michael Bland and Tommy Barbarella, illustrious members of the first incarnation of the new power generation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thanks for My having pleasure. us. pleasure. We're talking about Diamonds and Pearls which years ago, which is a pretty incredible milestone for this record that y'all were heavily involved in. There's certainly a lot of records in Prince's catalog where there's a band with them, but they weren't in the studio. They weren't involved that much until the tour started. This is a different story. What are your favorite memories? I'll start with uh, Michael. What's your favorite memories of the recording sessions for this album? Um. I guess that my earliest memory was just that Sonny and Tommy and I were um, in a in a project in a different project that Prince was running. Uh, he had made a solo record with with Margie Cox, and we were going to be like the, the her backing band. And so I was basically doing double duty. I was already in Prince's band, and also in Margaret's band. And we were rehearsing at Paisley one day, and Prince comes downstairs just as Sonny and Tommy and I were leaving. And uh, he had this idea for a song. And um, uh, so we, he's like, do you have a minute to help me work this out? And uh, we weren't in a particular hurry. We were just at a downtown. I think we were going to eat and then maybe go down to Bunkers. And I, I think it was, a, it was a Monday night. And... Um, so I was like, yeah, 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 it's six o'clock. I mean, we don't have to be anywhere for, for a while. So we stayed long enough to work out the song. And then Prince was like, well, can we just record it quick before you guys leave? So then we just moved the operation into Studio B and recorded it. And it, I think it was the first time that he recorded with the three of us together, with Tommy and Sonny and I. And uh, it went quick. It was efficient. Um you know, if, uh, if it was, um, he was very open uh, to the creative energy that was around, and that song was "Diamonds and Pearls," actually, and it went so well that um, he sent his <laughs> his bodyguards down to bunkers later on that night, and they Prince wants you guys to come uh, back out to the studio once you guys are finished. And uh, so we went right back out to Paisley Park and recorded. Um, uh, a song called Live for Love, which is the last song on the record. And um, so I guess before that, I had done a few sessions where it was just Prince and I. Uh, he'd just play piano and just kind of tell me when the changes were coming and so on and so forth. But it was it was still early in our recording relationship. and um, But that was, a, that was a major move because um, we also ended up recording... Um, Quite a few songs on that 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 record were really like live performances in the studio. Um, Cream, uh, Jughead. Um, just diamonds and pearls. We were talking about live for love. I think Willing and um, Able is that mainly live as well, or is Willing that? and Able was. Yeah. yeah. Actually, well, I don't I remember. Mean Kirk, to... I remember Kirk in the. Uh... In the other booth in Studio the A Kungas? on the Kungas, and uh, yep, I was willing um, and able. I I don't know if we want to. <laughs> I don't know if I want to match which with Rella, but I I have a different recollection. Uh, well, that's the, that's the interesting part. That's why I wanted to do it with you because we all remember things differently. Yeah. Um. That and that's what's crazy about the, the time with with Prince. It was like so much happened every day that you know i don't you remember certain things memory's a funny thing and then but then when we get around the other guys it's like you remember this no but i remember this everyone remembers different things and yeah see my my funny. memory of 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 willing and able i what i recall is recording the 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 basic track for willing and able money doesn't matter tonight and um strolling uh, on uh, a particular evening in Tokyo at uh, the Sony Recording Studios. Um, it was at the end of the nude tour. Japan was the last stop. And I had the stomach flu, and I was trying to stay in my room until, you know, until, like, the show started. 
But Prince got bored and booked, booked the studio. And it was Levi and Prince and I in this little studio uh, uh, recording the basics for that. <laughs> what you're probably remembering, uh, uh, Tommy, is one of those instances where we recut something for the sake of... Uh, I, I, there were so many times where we re went and re-recorded things. I think that you're probably remembering... Uh, well, no, that wouldn't have been the NBA thing we did. Uh, no, because the the part, the main uh, guitar part on the, the song, that arpeggio, do 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 do, that's me on a Korg T3. I remember the patch. It was like the nylon guitar patch. And I believe you be played it. I, I, I'm not questioning the fact that you... you I thought we were all there. I, I don't... That's what I'm saying is I... I remember like having anxiety about leaving my room because <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> trying to stay well, in a comfortable environment because things were happening. I went over there and, and, and it was like you know when you get sick and you feel like you're bumping into yourself, uh -huh. like it was full on like it. I was that sick and trying to stay in my hotel room in in Tokyo. And I think the same night that I cut the basic. With, with Prince and Levi for Will and Abel, Strolling, and uh, Money Don't Matter Tonight, we also recorded um, uh, a rough demo of a song called Five Women for Joe Cocker. Like, it was one of these situations where it's like Prince just had these ideas, and they kept coming, and I was trying to get out of there as quick as possible, and every time I hear Will and Abel, I'm telling you, I have a tactile... <laughs> A physical response. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not. We don't forget. Yes, and I'm not. Again, I'm not saying this in the interest of dispute. What I'm saying is that maybe we were there, and this got squeezed in somewhere in between the process, like where you recorded on it. It's like yeah, there's so much happening, so uh, so much happening all the time that uh, it's yeah. It, I think it would be impossible for any of us to remember 100. percent yeah. Of what 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 went down. But do you remember the sessions in the studio A where you were in the drum room, Kirk had a percussion set up in the other ISO room. Absolutely. Those were the, the all, room. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That happened all, all the time. I mean Right. Between Diamonds and Pearls and the Symbol album, that was yeah. the main setup from from looking out from the from the the ISO booth for the drums, Levi was always sitting over here. Sonny was sitting on this side of the window for me. You were, uh, I think you were always on like the, like studio, like left hand side, like that rig was set up, and uh, Prince on piano often, but sometimes on guitar, yeah. and Kirk next door, and then I remember like even like Jughead was like, Rosie was in one of the uh, the airlocks with a microphone. And like Tony Damon and Kirk were in another one, mm -hmm. like it was it, I, that was like full on live recording, you know, in an era where a lot of people had already given it up. They weren't recording like that anymore, you know. I have a question. I want to point towards Tommy. Prince had already by himself in the studio with nobody helping him besides for an engineer. What do you think made him want to widen the circle and get, you know, somebody in the percussion room and Rosie Gaines and all, all the money, all the headaches, all the scheduling that comes with that? What do you think prompted Prince to make this such an ensemble period in his career? Well, I think two things. I think one, um, he assembled this band. Um, you know, he, he wanted, he made music all the time. So he had a band of folks who are always going to be around who could play anything, you know? So I, I think more, more than anything, this, you know, this band was capable of actualizing his most complicated ideas. It's like, there was, there wasn't much he could throw at us that we couldn't actualize. And, you know, he loved that. So, you know, we, we were in town and we were always around and it was, you know, so, having that access um was that's what he wanted and um it's what he needed you know and i think you know what what we all brought to the the table was 
you know, there were things that he, um, it just widened his palette, so to speak, of, uh, of what, what his, his sound is, what he could do. Um, and the other thing is, you know, he, I think he was always trying to um, recreate Sly and the Family Stone. He always wanted that, that mix, that mixed up band that was a great band, but um, had the different elements, had the different voices, uh, people coming from different places and, you know, throwing it all together into the mix. You're with Purple Current and The Current, and I'm chatting with two esteemed members of New Power Generation and also incredibly elite players in in world history, but certainly in Minneapolis history as well, coming up as a musician. I was very, and the reputation of New Power Generation. And a little bit of what you were just talking about, Tommy, it does make me realize that you guys were top flight here and remain top flight internationally in a way this is no knock on the revolution but y'all have gotten different phone calls in your career as far as what you can bring um outside of talking about being able to play at the highest levels prince could imagine now my question about that is did did that change? I, I was listening to an interview with you yesterday, Tommy, where you talked about adding the fusion turnaround to get back, I think, out of the bridge from Diamonds and Pearls. Ideas like that, churn them out before you got to hit at bunkers. I know Prince worked very fast. Uh, this question is for both of you. Do you think that having more cooks in the kitchen made it faster or slower? I think definitely faster for him. I mean, uh, someone someone dug up Carmen uh, Carmen Electra song the other day and shot it over to me and like remember this and uh, <laughs> Steve Noon an engineer is like did did we record that in London or uh, um, what was that Olympia in London or mm. at Paisley I'm like I don't remember honestly I but I remember cutting <laughs> about half that I thought <laughs> again who knows what's true but I remember cutting half that record in like one day in studio a and we didn't know what it was or who it was for it was just tracks and uh but yeah the speed with, that we could turn stuff out was um what was the question oh too many cooks in the kitchen it's like yeah I, yeah it was definitely efficient because you know we all we all also knew our place you know he was he was calling the shots and if he didn't like your ideas you wouldn't use them and he he would often send me into the studio after the fact because we would cut basics then he'd go in and use what he liked and replace what he didn't like or add stuff um, but sometimes he would send me in to do that very same thing he's like go in and produce up this this track that we just cut or uh, maybe an old track um and you know at the time i was just like holy shit i can't believe this he's trusting me to do this and um and, and then the next day it'd be like, well, what would you think? Did you like that? I remember one time it was um, that song Old Friends for Sale. And I was like, I'd heard about this song because I think it was on the Black Album or something originally. But I was just, the song, the title, it was like, wow, I can't wait. I'd never heard the song. I just heard about it. And then he sends me into the studio to replay the piano part for it. And this is in my first year or two. And I was just like, holy crap. I can't believe this opportunity. I spent all night, you know, a million takes of that piano track. And the next day, I couldn't wait. I'm like, what'd you think? What'd you think? He's like, you played too hard. And I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and then after the fact, I was like, yeah, he was probably right. He was always right, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's like he he would he would take what, what he wanted. And, you know, because he could do anything you could do. And, um, but he was looking for something different you would bring you would bring <clears throat> uh michael what's live from that record from diamonds and pearls when you guys hit the road what what became even more exciting to do in a live setting oh wow um you know it's it's difficult to explain the like the process the the like the transition from studio to to live i mean we sometimes it went the other way so a lot of ideas were conceived 
while we were just jamming around, just knocking around things. So it's it's I don't I'm not sure honestly how to answer that question. Because it didn't just work the one way. Some things started in the studio. Some things started on stage. Sometimes we just, something would happen and we'd be, it's just, this is, and you know, he'd go back and watch the the videotape. Like, we got to do something with that groove right there. You know? Um, I think that's how uh, Rock and Roll is Alive happened. Um, oh. And it lives in Minneapolis. It was like, we, he was running a tie line from the sound stage to Studio A. And he caught a. He started talking to the audience. We were it was we were jamming on "Get Wild," and he started talking to the audience and got them saying, "Rock and roll is alive and it lives in Minneapolis." We look up. He's ready to cut the song like the next day. So it's you know what I mean. It's. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Sean. I will say this: It's like the longer we rehearse something, even if it was a new song the more it would evolve and change and get more complicated and more complex. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, before the Diamonds of Pearls tour, you know, by the time that tour happened, that some of those songs we'd been playing for a while, they were getting kind of old. So he would just keep adding parts. I remember, you remember that chromatic rise to, to loop the chorus of Diamonds of Pearls? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then Rosie would just soar. It was... yeah. Oh, it's man. just there was a, a, with that much talent in the room. There's so much you can do, and so many ways you can change things from, you know, from performance to performance. It just and Prince had a very uh, short sort of uh, attention span. Right. So we were always changing things up, moving things around. What? I love the quote I always said that Prince said. If I'm bored, they're bored. So if, if if it's not moving me, I gotta I gotta make it interesting. I think that level of inventiveness paid off well throughout his career, but certainly um, in this era for sure. Uh, one of my favorite writers talking about Prince is a gentleman from New York named Miles Marshall Lewis, and he talks "Sign of the Times" kind of being the last record from Prince where he didn't directly engage with hip hop and how big hip hop and rap was becoming. And that after that point, there was either it was a, a response involving rap or a response sort of issuing rap, but that, that was in the conversation as people who were in that of princes that has some of the most rapping on it. How were you guys as an ensemble and Prince in particular relating to what was happening uh, with hip hop and rap at that time? Wow. Um, I think I was still, uh, I, I was not, other than a handful of groups, I was not completely sold on hip hop as a movement or a thing. I mean, for me, it spelled the, um, you know, the demise of my profession. <laughs> Samplers, you know, electronic drums and whatnot, loops and all that. So I had a, I had a chip on my shoulder about it, you know. So ever since I saw the first, you know, the, the first guy I ever saw, like, on a turntable, you know, rocking a, rocking a whole room with, you know, and so I had, I had beef with hip hop right away, <laughs> trying to, trying to get rid of me. Um, but, um, I think that, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to say what it was now than, than at the time that we were doing it because we tried a lot of things that other people weren't trying at the time. In Prince's head somewhere, he went, what if we I had a band that sounded like, that sounded like hip hop, you know, with real instruments? And this is before The Roots, you know? I think that, you know, a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do was influenced by, by hip hop, definitely. I think Levi and Prince listened incessantly to what was going on industrially and they you know bring it all in our direction and we try to distill it into something more tangible like less dj driven and more instrument driven and um you know i i it's um it's funny because um I see see online people d debating all the time about like this particular period in Prince's music, you know, and some people liked it, other people didn't, you know, and I know there 
you know, I've been speaking to Mike Howe about the the you know the the re-release of Diamonds and Pearls they're working on. And my first question was, how do you think this stuff is going to age? You know, I mean, it's it was recorded not not in a vacuum, but in a completely different. You know, a a a, a it was a period different from any other period of Prince's canon. You know, let alone like, well, what what was it? What happened <laughs> at the time that we were doing it? You know, I I I think. It's going to be interesting to see how they put it together. Um, um, but I guess ultimately, you know, whether somebody's rapping or singing, my job is the same anyway, you know. And I guess that's how I looked at it, other than just the fact that we, we were really there to just kind of, you know, uh, not think of reasons why or why not. We were just there to get it done. So that was our general attitude. It's like, well, okay, Prince says study tramp, like really study how it drags and this and that, you know. Prince says, you know, go go out to the glam slam, go sit in the DJ booth, go see what the dude's spinning, go, you know, a lot of that is just research, par for the course, so on and so forth, you know. And I had there were records that I liked, you know, but um. Yeah, generally it was um, you just kind of trying to make sense of it all, you know. And the only way you know whether you, what you're doing is right or wrong is what Prince has to say about it. Like, yeah, that's it, that's it. Okay, okay, I'm somewhere. I'm somewhere he approves of. So stay in that zone, <laughs> and you know, do more of that. <laughs> is that similar to your experience? Todd? New textures from hip hop and trying to integrate them in on the keyboard. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, these were, this was, well, Diamonds of Pearls era, uh, since we're talking about that, that was the early days of using samples live. So this is before people were running Pro Tools, even before they were running tracks with a, on a DAT tape. Um, you know, we were doing everything live. We were triggering everything live. And um, so daddy pop the first loop i guess prince ever played with was played with my with this finger on a low f and i had to hold it the whole time right because um, i had i didn't have the technology to to run the loops back in right. my station yet that right. came was, later uh, yeah so and daddy pop i literally and what what was that loop? That was uh that was um rock steady. Yeah, I Bernard Purdy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Prince <laughs> And just that was you know vicious. So I'm holding yeah. that loop with one <laughs> finger. And then I put other samples nearby where I can hit with my other fingers, some other hits and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then with the other hand, I'm playing actual keyboard parts. And that became that kind of became a, a template for a lot of what we did at that time, where mm -hmm. I was covering a lot of ground, but um, you know, hitting samples um, and, and playing traditional keyboard parts. Yeah, and then as that evolved, by the end of my run, I was only playing samples. <laughs> right, Claire <laughs> Fisher, orchestra samples, and <laughs> I mean, the funniest was that day. What was it? Uh, not get wild, but uh, maybe it was get wild. It was one of those where it was like we jam it forever and it's like break it down. Tommy on the one, boom, and I would play all my parts. My right. parts were samples of him playing bass and I'm playing guitar. <laughs> and we're all like, and then he'd be like, "Yeah, Tommy's funky," and I'm like, "But yeah, I'm literally just triggering samples." <laughs> <of> you, <laughs> playing guitar and bass. Yeah. And that, my friend, is when I was like, when we had started playing, uh, doing the greasy meal thing. And ah. that's when I'm like, I don't want to play any samples in this band. I just want to play real keyboard parts. Like, I'm only going to play Rhodes, Clav, sure. Organ, or Whirly. That's all I'm going to do. And that's what I did. You are but yeah, that was uh, the start of that hip hop sample stuff. 
Yeah, and what's funny is the smaller the band got, the 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 uh, the smaller the band got, the the more samples had to be <laughs> added to, <laughs> to cover the ground. And I mean, basically, the way I looked at it, Morris was playing like towards the end of the original run of the New Power Generation, when it was just like the four of us and Maite and Prince, Sonny, Tommy, Morris, me, Maite, Prince. That that group, like Gold Experience, uh, come like that band. There was so much technology going on, uh, and program changes had had to happen so quick that it, it eventually, uh, well, who was the company that made it? I think it was the MIDI Remote Control was made by Lexicon. Yeah, and we all had these things because our. Our our programmers couldn't keep up with how fast things would change during the show. I mean, we were Prince, we were pushing the technology to the brink. For yeah, sure. No sequencers, uh, Sean. Uh, yeah. You know now, and I will say this, and and it's kind of a dig, but um, somebody in wardrobe uh, went to work for Janet Jackson during that time, and came back. You know what story I'm talking about, Tommy? Uh, it sounds familiar. Yeah, I can't remember what her name was, but she was like. I never knew how good you guys were. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And she said, I just did a month with Janet Jackson. She said, one day I decided to get down to wardrobe like an hour beforehand to organize some things. And I heard the band start playing. Like, in, you know, like, like soundcheck started. And she was like, and she said to herself, what are they doing here already? And she said, she ran out to the, to the auditorium, you know, and, there wasn't nobody on stage. <laughs> it was just the tracks playing. And, you know, so I don't think I need to say much more about it, John. I'm just saying. <laughs> you are tuned. She found the out that day that we we were live and, and Janet was Memorex, at least at that time. <laughs> You are tuned into Purple Current and The Current. I am really honored to be joined by Tommy Barbarella and Michael Bland. We've covered a lot of ground around Diamonds and Pearls, and I want to talk just, um, about what y'all were listening to before you started doing this. I was thinking a lot about your influence, and I don't mean Prince's influence. I mean Michael Bland and Tommy Barbarella's influence on my generation of Minnesota musicians. And I think about this very elite, gospel-informed R and B aware, rock, like the multi genre thing, and just absolutely virtuosic chops that y'all did. And now there's a we can study y'all, but who did you guys study? Like when you were trying to be the baddest band on earth, which you became, who were you studying to do that? Well, to me, it's like you didn't have to really even look that far. You're in Minneapolis. I mean, I. I don't, I remember the first day that I met Tommy. He was at the, it was at the fine line. Your hair was short and you had some dap shoes on <laughs> and, um, and a woman with you. Yeah. A woman <laughs> and makeup. And you guys, you and Sonny were playing with the steels. That's what happened. And I think that Prince also picked up on this synergy that was going on. You know, it, within the city. I mean, prior to then, I mean, the revolution was mostly people from Minneapolis, but that middle band, the Love Sexy band, the Sign of the Times band, all almost all those people were from somewhere else. I mean, Levi and Sheila were from the Bay, California. Yeah. I think Cat was from Chicago. Um, Bonnie Boyer was from like San Francisco or Oakland. You know, so really, I think Prince just kind of kept. After the Love Sexy tour, and he came home, he just kept hanging around, going to see you know what was going on in the city. Well, and the bunkers, the bunkers gig bunkers started in eight, part of eighty-eight, that. right? Yeah, so oh, eighty-seven technically, but yeah, he yeah. came right in there and was like, "Oh, okay, you, 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 <laughs> not you," <laughs> and, and did the same with the Steels. Took Tommy and Sonny right out of the Steel. Oh, rat, rat, rat. I'll take those two dudes. Now I got something. <laughs> you know, like, um, I guess that's the, the funny part is that we, I don't want to say that we were our own contemporaries, but I think that um, we already knew each other and had been working together before we met him. 
Yeah. So you were listening to the people down the street and you were figuring out how to put it together and had a lot of great company. Tommy, was that kind of your world too, or were you had more of your head in the in records from other scenes, et cetera? Well, I know the the question you actually it's interesting the way Michael answered it because what you're obviously asking is who are your influences? Who did you listen to? And that and and I can answer that too, but you know what Michael said is interesting because it's like you ask anyone now and it's like who is your influence and it's who they list who they watch on youtube or you know mm-hmm. digging but in our era you know live music was all around us so and you were inspired by you're much more inspired by seeing someone up close in person live mm-hmm. with sweat running down their face and having your ears just blasted mm-hmm. than anything you'll ever see on YouTube. So we're lucky. We we grew up in that era, you know. First time I sat in with the combo, got my ass handed to me. It was like the greatest night of my life. You know, it was like um it was brutal. You know, that's how we came up. It was like you had to cut your teeth with your elders who mm-hmm. knew so much and were so good and um and that's what made you work really hard. It's like, and it was live or die. It was like everything just meant so much. It was like, so oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I, when I played, it was like for so many years, like I played like it was my last solo. It was the last statement I would ever make. And it just meant everything. And, and that's how that band played. And, you know, and that's how Prince always played, obviously, you know, you yeah. have that intensity, mm-hmm. um, you know, but. So, so there is there is that, um, and I think that's a really unique thing and something that is lost on this generation now. It's like it just doesn't happen like that so much, as nearly as much. Um, well, also because yeah. it's so easy to see the, the most incredible things that have ever happened. <laughs> just go to YouTube, and you could you know you can get right. lost down any wormhole and see the most incredible. You know, you you can go go on there and watch, uh, what's his name, uh, Corey Henry, <laughs> for you know, <laughs> you can get your mind blown for two yeah. hours straight just watching clips. Yep. You know. <laughs> well, the crucible you know, but- that y'all came out of is really impressive. And uh, uh, Tommy, I, I I ran over you. I'll let you finish. What were, what were you going to say? Uh, just you know, as far as putting that Diamonds and Pearls band together, um. We did come from different places. Some people came, you know, Sonny came from the same place as Prince, kind of uh, in literally and musically yeah. in a lot of ways. But mm-hmm. most of the other guys, um, obviously, and Rosie, you know, have had the gospel background and all that. Me, not so much, although I played with the Steels. I learned some stuff from them. But, you know, <laughs> I grew up playing classical piano, um, <coughs> playing jazz, jazz gigs around town at that time so you know i was bringing bringing that with me um the yeah. story i love to tell is the first rehearsal the first the day of the first rehearsal with that band um we were just jamming prince kept telling me to lay out <laughs> and uh then afterwards or on the break or whatever he came he's like tommy you know uh you ever heard grand central station and i was like nope and he was like <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> this is like so, which just to me is like, I can't believe I was so out of my element in some ways. You know, I didn't have that repertoire. I had, you know, I knew Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, but I didn't know that next level. And I knew Sly, but I didn't know Larry. So mm-hmm. it was talk about going to school. I always say yeah. working with Prince, like going to school. For me, it was like, I was going to school and going to night school 